yourselves, and then we'll let Viper take over and get going, okay? So, okay. Jeff Jansen, Buddy Wallace, Jason, Phoenix. I'm Rod Flood, the Mayor of the Public Service, also based on the Mayor. I'm Gary Pasquino from the Shown in the picture above. 
And lastly, the turbulent kinetic energy is uh, was uh, this was done with a 3D model to understand the turbulence in the system. Turbulent kinetic energy was approximately 450 uh, foot pounds per slug, and is concentrated along the center line of the flame holder uh, of the V gutters of the flame holder. This shows that we have a lot more turbulent flow in the uh, within that region. Uh, next, hot flow analysis. Hot flow analysis. We have two main objectives. The first is to determine the maximum temperatures that we'll, we will see in the system. The second is to determine the optimal thermal couple configurations that will ultimately drive the instrumentation layout and uh, give us a viable uh, temperature map. Here we have a video of the hot flow analysis. So in the hot flow analysis, we have two sparks that are ignited as this is a 2D model. Uh, for, as there is a limited computational ability, we couldn't do a 3D model. However, it shows us a, a pretty good idea of what's happening in the, in the flow. This uh, video is approximately 30 seconds or 20 seconds long, but in, uh, in reality, this is occurring within one second. So it's approximately 0.94 seconds actually. So it's occurring at a very fast rate. Uh, the models used for this simulation was a, for the turbulence model was a K epsilon realizable model. It's, uh, it's usually utilized for flow over bluff bodies. And for the combustion, uh, we use a species transport volumetric uh, reaction. And it was, we used a finite rate eddy dissipation model to uh, model the ignition and the, the, the whole combustion process. Therefore, all these uh, simulations, we have successfully created a uh, viable CFD model that really increases the confidence of uh, our of our product. Now, I'll pass it on the time to John Hub to found We have a small leak in our manifold, which was sealed for the after. And as you can see in the picture here, uh, we had diminished flow from a bar five, which after we disassembled everything, we found there's debris from the. Uh, water supply hose that had washed up into it and plugged stuff. Um, but it, we also were able to, um, we had successful impingement as seen in a circle there, uh, especially as we increased the flow, um, the streams turned into sprays and uh, hit each other turned into a fine mist. Right. So the next uh, thing we did was we applied the blower to it. So we uh, had the water flowing through the fuel injectors and then um, had the blower operate at full power. Then we uh, flowed water through from low to full flow um, to observe fuel air mixing. So from that, uh, we were able to observe atomization. You can see the top picture here uh, within the circle. Uh, shortly after the water exited the um, injectors from the holes, it turned into a fine mist, um, which we again confirmed uh, at the, um, the exhaust end, with the exception of the, the water that hit the um, outer casing turned to droplets, the inner cone was a fine near homogeneous mist. Um, and there was also minimal pooling in the combustion chamber, meaning that we didn't have any potential fuel sitting at the bottom um, as well. Now to Tanner Gray for hot test. Thank you, John. So I'll begin with the purpose of the hot test. So the main purpose is to compare the single V flame gutter and the double V flame gutter that we discussed earlier. And to accomplish this, as also mentioned earlier, we will be measuring temperatures in five locations, one in the connector, four in the combustion chamber to create a sort of temperature map. And uh, we'll be measuring total and static pressures in two locations. Uh, the procedure for the hot test will begin every test with a blower test. So we'll ensure that there are no leaks in the system and the system is still sound. And, um, and then also ensure that all instrumentation is active and reading properly. Uh, then each separate hot test itself has a separate plan that has a varied fuel rate from 4.8 grams per second as our lowest, all the way up to 10 grams per second. These values were chosen because of the lower capability of the uh, blower of the blower and the upper capability of the fuel supply system on the test stand. Each test will also have a varying burn time from as short as 30 seconds to as long as on, 1 minute 30 seconds. Also with each test, uh, very, various camera recording angles will be used to uh, gather as much observational data as possible. And now I'll also continue on to the post-hot test observations. 
So for the single uh, V flame holder, uh, the inner liner uh, had very little combustion occurring in the cooling zone. Uh, so from both the picture and uh, from the tape, as you can see, uh, we can say that the cooling area did its job in keeping, helping the outer casing stay cool and away from it, uh, its uh, melting temperature. And you can also see from the tape that the propagation of the flame starts about seven inches away from the start of the flame holder. That gives a, a rough recirculation zone of about five inches, so close to what was predicted in the ANSYS, um, uh, ANSYS calculations. The single V flame holder also gave us uh, stable combustion that was uh, self-sustaining and, and smooth uh, as, as we could prove from the uh, inner casing because as the, there was very little turbulence when the flow was coming out of the exit and also that the fl flame front was further away from the flame holder as they previously that the seven inches away uh, because there was no burnt area on the flame holder it, it was uh, still clean as when we put it in. So uh, for this single B video, uh, you will see that there is very little combustion actually occurring in between the inner liner and outer casing, and that this proves the what we had what I had said earlier about the inner liner being having very little burnt area on the um, in the cooling channel that uh, we designed. Uh, now for the double feed flame holder, the inner liner, uh, it's the reverse of the single flame holder. We had uh, combustion or current in the cooling area uh, due to the increased amount of turbulence. And as you can see, there's a very large burnt area on both of the inside and the outer portion of the inner liner. And that the flame uh, is only four, eight, four inches away from the front of the flame holder instead of seven inches of the single flame. The double V also had stable combustion and it was self-sustaining, but it was extremely uh, turbulent. So it tended to want to uh, quit or die out once in a while whenever we got too close to the uh, not enough fuel and too much air. So we got away from the, the, that proper mixing point. And that the flame front was near the flame holders because the flame holder for the double V was burnt in some locations. And, um, to the video. So this video, you will see that there is uh, flame coming out of where the double V and uh, where the uh, inner liner and outer casing are. And you can also, at the beginning there, you could see a pop that happened due to the, what we assume the turbulence that uh, was happening. And this turbulence was caused by the attachment rod, as stated previously for the double flame holder, because the attachment rod on the back of the flame holder created an extra recirculation zone behind it. So it added a lot more turbulence than just the second V would have added all that. And now I'll pass it off to Sean Burr for the single V analysis. So as we see here is a picture of two of our PO tubes. Uh, so during our, during, our te excuse me, during our testing, the PO tubes uh, that were connected to the pressure transducers did not remain stationary and also uh, one of the PO tubes to this location, the one that was supposed to be measuring static pressure, actually created a vacuum, so we did not get accurate data uh, with those pressure transducers. So due to these reasons, uh, we did not use the pressure data to analyze the afterburner. So we are just focusing on the temperature data that we received from the thermal couples. So just to reiterate, here's a picture of the physical layout of the afterburner with the with the thermal couples, excuse me, and uh, where they're located. Here is a temperature map of what was happening during testing for different mass flow rates of fuel and the different thermal couples. So, as you can see, as my colleague stated earlier, by about uh, seven inches, we get the max temp. So, by about the third thermal couple, it's kind of where it maxes out. And also, you can see how the temperature is almost linear after the flame holder. Here we have a graph of the standard deviation of the temperatures. So it's important to note that at 5.5 grams per second of fuel, that gave us the best standard deviation. And this means that at this uh, mass flow, we have the most stable combustion because the temperatures were not fluctuating as much. And uh, as you saw in the video, 
Uh, the flame was not you know, fluctuating or being very turbulent, it was very smooth. And that's what we saw at, with the 5.5 grams per second. I will also be going over the double V analysis. So again, here is a temperature map for the double V temperatures and mass fuel flow rates. So as you can see, it's, uh, the temperature get, reaches its max quickly. So as my colleague stated earlier, about, about four inches after the flame holder. So by about the second thermal couple. And also you can see how the temperatures are very high. Here is a graph of standard deviation of the double V. So it's important to know that at 6.5 grams per second, it was the uh, best standard deviation for the double V gutter. So at this point, you have the most stable combustion using this configuration. And you can see that overall, there's quite a bit of deviation. And as you saw in the video earlier at the double V, uh, the flame was quite turbulent and there was some uh, acoustic rumble. Now I'd like to hand it off to Lauren Bowman, who's going to discuss the comparison between the two flame holders. Thank you, Sean. So to make an accurate comparison, we needed to compare um, the configurations using as much of the same um, using as much of the same constants as we could. So we tried to hold the fuel mass flow rate constant for each comparison. So to begin, this is a comparison with the 4.8 grams per second for the fuel. Um, this shows the double in the blue circles and the single in the orange squares. Um, as seen in this graph, the double does reach its steady state temperature sooner than the single. The 5.5 grams per second fuel flow was determined to be our most reliable set of data due to the small standard deviations as talked about previously. The double, again, reaches its steady state by about the one over two, whereas the single gear reaches its steady state near the end. For the 6.5 frames per second, we see the same trend of the double reaching its steady state sooner. For the 7.5 grams per second, we began to see that as we increase this fuel flow rate, the, uh, the configurations begin to act more similarly to each other, and we see less of a difference. So for the configuration comparison, this is the maximum temperatures that were reached for each configuration. So, for three of the four tests that were compared, the double V does reach a higher temperature. Um, looking at the 5.5 grams per second, the, which was determined to be our most stable, the single V does reach a lower temperature, but the, um, but the standard deviation was much smaller for the single V. Um, this leads the team to theorize that as the stability increases for this configuration, the temperature goes down. So that is the trade-off that was made. So to compare for the single V configuration, the actual data found versus the ANSYS data that was calculated, the, the actual data is in blue and the ANSYS is in orange. So the actual data that we did find was higher than the single claim, claim holder configuration actually made. And now I'm going to pass it off to Tanner Gray for the conclusions. Thank you, Mike. So I'll begin with equivalence. Uh, and fiber oxidase has achieved stable and stable smooth combustion for the single V flame holder. And we also achieved stable but turbulent combustion for the double V flame holder. And we gathered, uh, we achieved this through the gathering of the reliable ther thermal couple data on observations that we made both during and after the test. And overall, the team would uh, choose the single V flame holder as the optimal design for what we for our current uh, components that we have manufactured. So, recommendations, if uh, we could improve upon our current design, would be to improve begin with the improvement of the manufacturing of the uh, flame holders instead of being the folded sheet metal design uh, that we currently use. Either use casting or machined aluminum. Or, uh, if possible for the flame holders 
Uh, you, and then for the inner liner, uh, have it bent uh, at a better angle because currently the cooling channel is not consistent all the way around the blank, all the way around the afterburner. And the outer casing would be cut using the water jet cutter, so that way we would have much even uh, cuts along the, uh, and it would seal much better when actually fired. For assembly, uh, thanks to if we could improve the manufacturing of the inner and outer casing, this would also improve the inner and outer casing, inner liner and outer casings uh, attachments to each other. And then also for the flame holder supports, if, if instead we would attach the uh, attachment rod to the front of the double V flame holder, we would hope that it would decrease the amount of turbulence we got instead of what we currently did this time with the attached to the back. We would also attempt a liquid fuel or uh, find another test stand that uh, can handle a higher fuel flow, so that way we could test our afterburner at its full capability. Next would be instrumentation. We would use different higher temperature thermocouples, and we would also use more robust, robust PO tubes and measure uh, those both of those more accurately. And then the instrumentation head would have an increased number of thermocouples, and also the use of a the thermal gun to measure wall temperatures, so that way we could see, uh, see have verified data that the cooling channel is properly cooling the outer casing. So overall team hours, we were at we are at 95% of what our predicted hours uh, uh, say we should be at, which we find acceptable because we are able we were able to have only a full week and a half worth of testing and get done all the one test day that we had planned. Uh, for our budget, we were given $1,000 at the beginning of the semester. Most of our budget was spent on instrumentation, with some being spent on materials, and we had 17% of it left over, roughly $170. And now, thank you for coming out, and we'll take questions now. Instead of 
measured in static temperatures. So, and it would be just uh, fixing those two problems essentially. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, slide 71. So I'm a little curious about some, like, some of these on this one. Uh, so the 7.5, single flow for the single beam, has a higher temperature, even if it is just barely. Why do you guys think that is? Would you like to try to describe that one? So when we look at these, um, we were more concerned about the percent difference. So for the other three tests, the percent difference is much larger. So for the 7.5, um, I would say that that could be either a um, temperature gathering issue with the uh, accuracy of the temperature gathering because they are, it looks like less than five degrees off. Okay. Okay. This would be an unfair question to ask, but just yep. so you know, the next question I would ask is how would you verify it? That's, I just have to be on the scope of this guy. Um, another quick question to you on the 5.5. You're saying that it's more stable. Um, maybe I'm a little confused. Uh, it's a little, I'm just wondering, what do you mean by more stable? Do you mean today it's more stable? Uh, are you getting less variation? So, from what I know, and I'll admit, this is an area I'm weak in, this is the question. Um, if you're having more stable operations, should you? getting better progression. In a sense, it's more consistent. In theory, possibly, yes. From what I understand, that would make sense. But we also believe that the turbulence, increased amount of turbulence causes the higher temperature. And in this case, for the signal, we had less turbulence. Okay. So we had the less temperature. And the reason why we were calling this more stable is because of the, there is less variance in the temperature and there's less, and the flame itself is very stable. cross-sections created a lot of uh, turbulence at, at, in the wake of the flow. And that is not taken into account of in doing the 2D model analysis. And as you increase your turbulence in your system, 
combustion is really based on that. So that would be that would be that would have been good to take into account of as well. Gotcha. Uh, just a quick add-on, I guess, to recommendations over what we would want to do differently. Uh, kind of as we stated, just uh, making our parts a bit more accurate. I think that would I think that would help. I guess the overall design, the overall uh, combustion, just the way it works, and also you know overall accuracy of just each position. Those were kind of big things that we believe would have made a huge difference. And overall, I think these things would change. With limited time budget, we couldn't. We could only do two iterations in what we're doing, and also um, with extra time and money, of course, everyone wants those. Um, we could have contracted all our parts out and had these done professionally by people that do this every day, rather than having us a bunch of college kids try and build something like this. So, what's the experience? <laughs> I'm just saying, writing pools is very boring. So, uh, yeah, that's all I got. Yeah, nice job. Uh, just a couple quick questions. I think you said your inner liner was spaced an eighth inch from the outer. How, how did you decide on that spacing? They weren't. Uh, yeah, go ahead, John. I was going to say, uh, you can go first. Uh, you can go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we took into consideration uh, for the liner was not only cooling, but also sort of the Helmholtz resonators that we put to uh, damp the acoustics. You know, what's that, the size, um, I guess, of that backing for the air to go in or as you know, damping the acoustic noise. So that was part of what went into uh, figuring out what that one inch gap was. Okay, so I was thinking about whether or not you saw combustion in that cooling zone. I think the space that. Probably not. I mean, we believe that it's more of the attachment rod on the actual flame holder that is the fault of the turbulence. So it, it, that's not 100% because we never got a chance to test our theory. But we believe that our cooling zone did its job. Uh, so because we were able to walk up right after we got them testing and touch the, touch the outer case, and we were we wouldn't get burned. So we assume that it did its job. Same thing with the holes in this radar as well. That was done with the drill press, um, so it can't, you don't have too much accuracy with that. So was that, so the infringement that you did get was that 25% of the total for? Well, um, that wedge there, so that's about 18%, okay. so one okay. six. So it was just that area. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, there was a little bit on the other ones, but that one, all four holes, or all four streams on each one hit each other. Thanks, great job. So, um, let's start off with safety. Um, describe your safety procedure. I think it covers those well. Do you have a procedure or a safety manual uh, that you put together for this project? Yes, we do. Okay, so you have the safety manual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have the test readiness plan that include a whole whole paper that includes safety precautions and then a, okay. a bottle checklist that Same you question for your office. Yeah. Oh, okay. We'll still have to make it okay. okay. So, um, question I have here is, is I'm trying to put together a preliminary design review and what you were basing this on and connecting that with um, so since in our preliminary design, uh, we did design a ramjet, which kind of acts similarly to an afterburner, 
So that's how we kind of uh, based our decision to build that because we couldn't really build a full scale uh, ramjet like we would want to. But, uh, so we kind of decided to build an afterburner and we wanted to obviously test something and uh, uh, compare something. So you know, the, the purpose of our test, that's why we chose to do the different flame hole configurations. I don't know if Tanner and Wales have anything to add on. I see that as a good yeah, I, I guess what I'm trying to what I'm trying to come to is how your Mach two ties in with the air flows and, and how how that it, 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 it doesn't. There was no way we'd be able to get the Mach two flow right. without the capabilities. So, so I, I guess it would be nice to have seen a, a slide or two on how you tie that together and how the assumptions you had to make or uh, how you had to readjust stuff. I was trying to uh, make a little clarification. We, it was pretty much just a whole redesign for the afterburner. We didn't really take um, any numbers or calculations from our preliminary design since we had to more or less design around the capabilities of our, the fuel, uh, mass flow rate, the capable test rate, and the capabilities of the uh, air mass flow rate. So, wasn't super innocent close to face off of uh, the numbers that we got. Yeah, they're not very linked together because of the, our limited capabilities. It, our prelim and detail are very much separated. I, I understand. Okay. Yeah. But in fact, I'm commenting on sort of junior achievements, if you will. Uh, I think you did a pretty good job in positioning things with the limited capabilities you have. So one question I had, I think you did sort of prove it out with your flow simulations, but you assumed a uniform flow coming into your field. You know, take a look at the slide seven or something, uh, nine, slide nine. Yeah. You assumed a, a uniform airflow, but then when I look at your inlet duct, uh, that was it's not necessarily a smooth finish on the inside of that uh, side of that thing. So I'm trying to figure out how much, if you had a lot of turbulence coming out of that thing, it would be smooth like that for Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 hey there. Uh, uh, let me do the manufacturing question. <laughs> 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 Uh, for the manufacturing portion, when this was fully attached, it it, it it does look like it's barely on there right now. When we fully attached it, we sealed it and we also uh, latching it out as much as possible. I mean, we, we obviously it did create some turbulence, definitely, but we believe it wasn't it wasn't a major issue for us. So, so, so you think you proved that with your, your static your static test? Uh, or you had your blower yeah. uh, without the point? Yeah, I, I, I believe we, we could we prove that with that. Uh, just one question on the solenoid uh, on the fuel supply. I didn't catch the purpose of that solenoid. I think you explained it very well. It, it's it's um, already integrated into the fuel supply system in the test lab. Um, the purpose of it is to automatically shut off the fuel if there's a flame out, so there's no uh, free propane um, in the lab itself. So there's there's a UV detector near the exhaust of it, and so when the detector stays on, I, I just didn't catch that. So
and you found some leaks and you found it clogged up in the check record and said, so the purposeful approach that you took to do that test, I think really is beneficial. Think, think that through, that's going to be important for the MC industry and so forth. I, I think you guys did a great job in terms of just having a very well thought out approach. Leaving, uh, you did your instrumentation, technology, look at your, your, uh, your uh, spray, everything leading up to the hot test so that you would maximize your chance for success. Uh, you did an outstanding job there, so, so really good job there. Okay. Um, let's see, a couple questions. Uh, page 32, it's looking at your thermal couple layout. And uh, you mentioned during the presentation that you had a stagger of the thermal couple, so I see some stagger. Actually, I see one from the first me in a different location. What what uh, caused you to pick the location of the program like that? In terms of where along it or why they're like just this, yeah, so. yeah, the, the, just the placement of the actual Uh okay, well part of it was the or Sean, you had your hand up. No, I was gonna say uh, <laughs> some of these for the locations of the thermocouples. We kind of based that off of some of the uh, values that were found in the cases uh, for the simulations. And as far as staggering them, uh, it would just kind of, I guess, uh, allow for manufacturers for things to be uh, not in the way of each other as far as uh, Yeah, otherwise, <laughs> because the number one thermal couple would have been right next to the uh, ignit igniter. So it may be possible that the igniter would jump to the thermal couple instead of the flame. So that idea of two walls of I noticed when the scope is used in RT silicone, uh, <laughs> you, you, you have leaks, or it was just something that you used just as a general sealant, and please tell me you didn't use it for structural No, we didn't use it for structural integrity, no. It was just purely sealing, uh, sealing because when we bolted everything together, we had, you know, t uh, ten of an inch gaps on either side, so we had to put a lot of RTV on it to make sure that it sealed. Okay, so uh, question about your, your standard deviation. So along the line of your flow, your mass flow increases, you have different data points that suggest that your variation at those different points, some of them were, you know, very, very tight, and others weren't, but it's, it's varying along the line of the mass flow. You've seen different results along those lines. Number one, what was that expected? Number two, what explains what explains the pattern of variation? Um, okay, so this was to show that so the um, squares are the uh, average temperature that were compared to each other, and then the standard deviation is just a um, method for us to see how turbulent the flow was. So that's why the 5.5 was determined to be our most stable because of its smallest standard deviation. Whereas like the 4.8 was determined to be one of the more turbulent um, iterations. Do we have a sample of the data? Not, no, no, we don't have the, the raw data. Okay, that's a, I think that explanation is so why, so for example, why is it highly turbulent 4.8 and not turbulent 5.5 and then the turbulence goes back up and then it goes back down and goes back up across? What, what do you think that is? Would you expect a different pattern or is it just random? Why would it be Uh, I just have a thought. I don't know if it's true, but I think <laughs> I think uh, some of the mass flow in the kind of the blower also uh, that has something to do with the turbulence, at least for the cases. Just since um, with with the instrumentation that we have, we do not know the exact mass flow that we have every time the blower, so that was not you know quote consistent every time. So that may. Uh, be possible to do yeah, because in each test we would set the mass flow of the field and then we would adjust the floor up and down so it's at that exact point where it comes But sometimes that may be off. Or sometimes. Uh, it's a, it's like a, so it's the inlet blower, it's uh, basically a damper that's on a threaded rod, and so it, it adjusts the inlet area of the blower. So we'd adjust it until we hit the, the 
is in the lean limit of the combustion. So there was some uh, variation on the inputs. Yes. In that, yeah. 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 That, that might explain it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, oh, like one more. I also want to congratulate you on the first time in the history of Cap 4 projects here at DRAU where you accomplished the project in less than an hour. I'm not sure what you're going to be tired. That's all I have. Okay. Um, oh. Good job. Yeah. 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 Getting combustion um, is easy. Getting semi-controlled combustion. <laughs> so, um, uh, but I do have a, just, a, just a couple questions in terms of you've got some CFD, you've got some placement of instrumentation, and and um, kind of kind of what what the rationale was uh, of some of that. So, so the the um, the blockage, okay, the block the, the blockage of of the two examples, the two, the two tests that you ran, um, was that the same? Yes. When, when in an ideal design, when we designed it in Katia, I specifically designed them so that the blockage would be the same. For manufacturing, they may not be exactly the same, but they should be relatively close to each other. So I, but I made sure you hold those, that constant. Okay. Yeah, outside there, you'll see we have the three printed ones, which are the exact scale, and then you can compare those to what was actually made. You can see the difference in the two. Okay, and the support mechanisms may not have may have increased. They were not the ideal. At all. Okay, um, and so when you when you couple the CFD to the to the results, especially when you got flames coming out of the out of the line area, was that expected based on the CFD results from the? You had, you had a two two flame holder versus a one flame holder. Two for CFD, or for the uh, just did you expect expect that flow to be forced to that? Oh yes, line? definitely. Uh, forced through a liner. I didn't. We didn't include the liner in the CFD model. That was just a that was not included. Uh, yeah. Um, sorry for coming. Yeah. Uh, we didn't really expect it to force its way through the inner the inner liner at all. It. Like I said before, we believe it had to be the attachment, but um, also we were limited in the capabilities of the CFD. We wanted to do the double flame holder in CFD to see what would happen because maybe, maybe it would happen with just the flame holder, but unfortunately, due to the limited capability of the computers on campus and time-wise, we weren't able to. <laughs> Let me say, I, I love the tape trick. I absolutely love the tape trick. When, when you said it's burned to here, that indicates something, and then it's not. Um, yeah. I mean, it's really, really hard to get measurements. I, I bought that one. That's a, like a baby measurement. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was. I, uh, I will or say it's planned because it, it totally was planned. Yeah, no, I think, it, I, think it's, I think it's awesome. And this is something that I would think you would think of and not tell you. <laughs> okay. No, I, that, that, that was, it was really, really good to be able to use that same technique. Um, to look at what was happening to that, that one, so I really, really applaud that. Um, so good job. The, the, the deal with one thermocouple at a location is a big deal, okay? That's a big, that can be a big issue. And so if you have, and I'm not even sure what you mean by stable combustion, but we can talk about that later. But, but let's say that the, the, the flow is more uniform or more, less mixing. Well, the chances of you getting a cold streak is good because the chance of getting a hot streak. Yeah. And so, and so sometimes it, it may just be an instrumentation thing, yeah. and not that the flow is actually um, reaching more uniform because you don't have any indication of uniformity based upon instrumentation with this one location. So, so um, that's just just my thought. The the last question. Is I like the water flow test. Absolutely, um, you're flowing propane, and so when you're looking at impingement, when you're looking at droplet size, when you're looking at flow rates, um, what's the correlation between the, the propane that you expect to be delivered to that area and the water? So, um, 
With the water, no, not really. The propane will be it's gassy, so it's going to mix readily, almost, almost instantaneously out of there. Um, we did this in case we had the time and equipment to do a liquid fuel, a liquid fuel. Um, but this also, like I said, allows to visualize, make sure everything was doing what we thought it was going to do. Um, but with the propane, we could have these things basically right up against the flame water. We probably still would have had this, the same mixing. Um, what was the other part of the question? I'm just wondering, like your mass, your, your the, and the whole, the whole um, jet stream out of this would be way, way different. Um, yes. Between the water. Okay, so I didn't know if you were, if you were using that, you have the impingement, and that would, you know, is, is that the, so is, is that something that you use to say, hey, we're going to get good, good those things? Or if you're just looking at it? Um, so with the propane, we couldn't really visualize that at all. So that's why I did this. Kurt um, checked all the gloss and stuff on ANSYS uh, for the propane next day. Um, and we also, in terms of mass flow, our mass flow meter was before all of this. So whatever was going through the, through the, the pipe was what's coming out the back end, or what's coming out of the projectors, regardless of where it's going out. So we, we know we had, we know the mass flow we had going in. We may not know exactly how much was in each area. And like I said before, the holes were designed so each one covered an equal area throughout the cross section. Of the end. Question back. Um, I want to ask a question regarding like that. Is it like when you say droplet size, do you mean like concentration levels or of the mixture? Or? Just looking at size and streams. And um, in doing that observation, and relating it back to the delivery system from a propane standpoint, or was it? I guess, I guess if, if you're really looking at this leakage that we have in the distribution, then, um, then that would be good. I thought, I thought when you were talking about it, you were trying to make a case for what the, what the propane is going to look like in terms of its injection characteristics. It will look a lot different. Okay. okay. Yeah, I just think that when you were talking about it, you were drawing more to Good job. Nice job, guys. Thanks. Have you guys ever built an afterburner, the liner 